so um, but I'm plenty warm. Matthew chapter 25, Matthew 25. Verse 31, the scripture says, When the Son of Man shall come in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory, and before Him shall be gathered all nations. And He shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And He shall set the sheep on His right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on His right hand, Come, ye blessed of My Father, Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was in hunger, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Now let's pray, and we'll ask the Lord to help us with our understanding of the Scripture today. Father, we do need your help today. It would not benefit us any if we created a social gospel uh, from this text of the Scripture. It would help us a great deal if we understood the imminence of Jesus Christ coming. And I pray that you would help us to comprehend that from this Scripture. We pray today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we last week were in the same chapter and we were looking at uh, the doctrine of eminence, really, if you wanted to summarize it, that is that Jesus Christ is coming soon. And it's, uh, it's one of those things that we're supposed to be ready for. Uh, the kingdom of heaven, Jesus says, like a man traveling in a far country. Remember this? And he had a couple servants, and he gave uh, one, one talent, one, two talents, and uh, another five talents. And the guy with five talents, remember, made five, another one made two, and one man uh, did nothing with his talent. He buried it and didn't use it at all. And he's an unprofitable servant. You know, uh, doing so uh, with your talent... Actually, we didn't, we didn't cover most of this in Fort Lauderdale last Sunday, did we? This was Miami Beach that I preached that text. I, I don't always preach the same messages in the two churches. And so last Sunday I preached about the talents. I preached about the, uh, the wise and foolish virgins here last week, didn't I? Okay, so both of those stories, y'all look at me just like, man, Pastor, I don't know when you preach that message, but <laughs> I, I know I don't pay attention, but that one really got me. <laughs> okay, I don't remember you preaching it. Well, I did preach that here. If you'd come to Miami Beach, you'd have heard that message last Sunday afternoon. So I preached the, the wise virgins in the morning and then the, um, and then the talents in the afternoon. Why did I do that? Why did I preach different message? Well, both of them have the same conclusion. But sometimes I get bored preaching the same message two times in a row, so I change it up a little bit. Uh, if you uh, come to Miami Beach, you may think that I'm going to preach from the same text, it'll be exactly the same message, and you'll find out that the Bible's got a lot in it. It's packed, and for different congregations, sometimes I'm led to preach a little differently. Well, the, the, the five wise virgins, remember this? We talked about the story of the bridegroom and how that when you've uh, made a deal to marry uh, a bride, then the groomsman is going to go home and he's going to build on his father's house a mansion or an apartment on the side of his father's house. And the entire time that they are betrothed or engaged, then the bride has to be ready for the groomsman to come. Now some of y'all ladies would think that's a lot of fun, especially if you don't want to spend a lot of money preparing for a wedding, you know, and uh, have to pick your colors and all these things. It's just be ready because the bridegroom is coming and he'll get you. And the illustration was that the bridegroom, the, the, the herald or the announcer said, Behold, the bridegroom cometh at midnight. And the wise virgins, they had their lamps and they had oil for their lamps. The foolish virgins had their lamps, but they didn't have oil for their lamps. And when the herald said, The bridegroom cometh! They said, ah, we need oil. Give us your oil. And the wise virgin said, no. If we give you our oil, we won't have enough for us. And so there we can... I remember, this is one of those Sunday school, one of these Sunday school lessons. Y'all ever see the piece of paper that you color? You know, I remember color. You miss the ones I'm talking about? They color this one, right? They got that lamp that looks like a yeah. pitcher or something, you know, with a little uh, deal out on the wick on the front of it. I've, I've colored this. 
And all I can remember from Sunday school class was that the wise virgin, virgins were selfish and wouldn't share the oil. <laughs> it's, I, I'm just telling you as a kid what you get when, when something's taught. I could tell you a lot of Bible stories and the conclusions that I drew. But they said, not so. Hey, if we give you our oil, we won't have enough for us. And the clear Bible teaching here that is that you cannot prepare for, someone else cannot prepare on your behalf for the Lord Jesus to come. You cannot be prepared for uh, by someone else. You have to be ready yourself. And so first of all, you need to know Jesus as yourself. And secondly, you need to prepare. You need to live for Jesus. And be ready when the bridegroom cometh. And then there was a second illustration. That was the illustration of the talents. I did not preach that here last week, but I'll summarize it for you. Uh, so there was a man that left on a journey, and he left with his stewards. And a steward is a manager. A steward's not an owner. A steward's a manager. Manages something for someone else. He left uh, five talents, two talents, and one talent with each of his stewards. And then when he returned, the man with five uh, said, "You know what? I've used, I've, I've had five, and behold, I made five more." So I doubled. It's 100% return on investment. The second man uh, said, I had two. You gave me two. Here's two more. And then the last one uh, said, uh, here's your talent back. I didn't. Uh, I was afraid because I knew that you're the kind of person that reaps where you haven't sown and you gather where you haven't straw. In other words, you are able to make something out of nothing with what you have. And I was really afraid because I did not want to uh, lose the talent that you gave me. Sort of a risk management kind of a thing. Except it wasn't. Because if you think about it, my friend, the, the Jesus said that the man said, you knew what kind of a man I was. At least you should have taken my talent and put it at the exchangers and I could have received you know, minimal interest on it. I could have gotten something for it versus burying it and doing nothing with it. In other words, even if I didn't get much, I could have gotten something. And let me ask you a question. Did the Lord need to give His servant or steward that to put it to the exchangers? Did He need the steward to take His talent and put it to the exchangers? The answer is no. He don't even need someone to do that. So He did less. He did less than the minimum with what the Lord had given Him. You know, here I think is a clear illustration of a person who not only doesn't live for Jesus and not only doesn't produce. See, we're not our own. The Bible says we're bought with a price. And we're supposed to glorify God in our body and our soul, which are God's. So we as stewards are minimally, minimally supposed to produce something, but this individual actually produced nothing at all. Or the idea of it is it's less than the minimum, which really would illustrate a person who has the truth and is a terrible testimony with it or doesn't live uh, what they actually are. And so each of these illustrations that Jesus gives ultimately are so that we could draw the conclusion that Christ is coming soon. Verse 13 of Matthew 25, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour where the Son of Man cometh. And then we, are going, we look in verse 25, at a separate event, and this event, in the events in, verse, in chapter 25, I mean to say, that we read about, are the coming of the Son of Man. You remember the three questions in Matthew 24 that Jesus was asked after He had said that the buildings of the temple, they're going to be thrown down, and not one stone is going to be left on another? The disciples came unto Him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of Thy coming, and of the end of the world? So what we saw in Matthew 25 are the signs of Jesus coming in the end of the, of the world. That's where we're at. So what are the signs of Jesus coming? Well, we know that in Matthew 24, Jesus said there aren't signs of when I come and take up the saints. In other words, you're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for the end is not yet. But in Matthew chapter 25 in our text today, we're seeing... The second coming. you know the difference between when Jesus comes and calls up the saints as is described in 1 Thessalonians 4? The difference is that Jesus' feet do not touch ground. In other words, we meet Him in the air. The Scripture is very, very clear that when the Lord Jesus calls us up that we're going to meet the Lord in the air. The second coming of the Lord Jesus, we're going to come with Him. We're going to follow Him. And Jesus Christ is going to 
literally when the Satan is bound and in prison for a thousand years, Jesus Christ is going to rule and He's going to reign on earth. And at that time, then the Satan is going to be released and He's going to lead a mob of the nations. Go to uh, Revelation chapter 40. I mean 20, chapter 40. Double it. <laughs> I'm having trouble today. I, I, you know, it's funny when you have a rhythm of how you do things normally and you get just a little bit off and it just, every, nothing goes the same. And the rhythm for me is that my wife is not only not here today, she's not home. You know what you do when your wife leaves you? You, you know, I told you guys this before, right? Fine. Make sure you have another lady in the house. There's one in our pantry. Her name is Betty Crocker. Yeah. And I go to her. My wife leaves. <laughs> well, I also have Anthony. <laughs> you go to Betty Crocker and, and, you, and you find out what to do when your wife is gone. And so she's been helping us. Actually, now Betty Crocker has not done anything special for us yet. We've had uh, chicken sandwiches and hamburgers so far, but I think Betty Crocker is going to spend some time with us later this week, and Anthony and I will do better. But anyway, yeah, it's bad when you tell people your wife left you, and so <laughs> you're with another lady, Betty Crocker. I hope Betty Crocker's been, she's been married for a long time, hasn't she? I hope so. She's not living, so hopefully, hopefully no one will... Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I just can't help my twisted sense of humor. All right, uh, chapter 20 of Revelation, not chapter 40. Uh, this is when Satan is bound. Look at, look at uh, verse 1 and 2. I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. And then verse 4, we begin to see the reference to the events in Matthew 25 in our text today. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads, or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Okay, now I don't have time to comment on those events, but Revelation is a chronological book, very easily understood in the introduction and in the conclusion of it. John is told, write the things which were, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. That's a three-part chronological outline of the Revelation. And if you look at it, you understand, well, John was actually a good writer. He followed his outline. Chapters 1 through 3 uh, are the things which were. Uh, that is, that's the church age. The things uh, which are would be uh, from, uh, from the, the time that you don't see the church anymore in Revelation. She's taken up, and that's when the judgments begin. There are individuals that, are, that uh, uh, don't understand the, the last, the final week in Daniel's 70 years. We've had 69 weeks, and there's one more week in Daniel's 70 years, which still has to be fulfilled. And a week is a measuring number, just like the word that we would use for a couple, or a dozen, or uh, words like dozen. Week is a measure of how many? Seven. seven. And so there are seven years. There's a midpoint in the uh, Great Tribulation. By the way, the same people that don't understand the 70 weeks and the last week, they also don't understand the difference between a tribulation that are events that are happening by man, man is causing, and events which are supernatural that only God could cause. You read the events of the tribulation period when God is judging the world, my friend, and it is not... Coincidental, isn't it? Like, wow, there's really earthquake, great earthquakes. I wonder if God's judging. No, my friend, these earthquakes will be different than those earthquakes. When hailstones of, of fire fall from heaven, when people look up and see God on His throne during the judgments, they won't be confused about what's happening. For my lifetime, and I know for lifetimes before that, individuals have tried to allegorize the judgment events in Revelation. Make no mistake, 
It is not persecution of the believers in the Revelation. It is judgment of God on unbelievers in the times in the tribulation period. And if, the, if those days were not shortened, if they were not a mere uh, seven years, then the Bible says no flesh would be saved. Let's make catch that door for us, okay? Uh, and anyway, uh, come on in. I'm not, I'm not people. Okay, all right, that's fine. All right, so... <laughs> all right, anyway... Um, that, the difference between that rev, that, that uh, tribulation period and other tribulation periods is that God is doing it. Is there tribulation today? Yeah. The Bible says, Yea, they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, right? Is there tribulation? Are there hardships? I promise you that individuals who are being tortured to death for their faith don't see... Uh, don't see this as a time when there's no persecution. There's tribulation today, but there's a great tri difference between having God's grace in tribulation and persecution and actually suffering at the hand of God Himself. Let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth He any man. And that temptation that James is talking about in that passage is persecution, things that teach us patience, things for which we need God's grace. And there's a marked difference. It's astonishing uh, how individuals can draw other conclusions, and it certainly is without the Scripture. It certainly is because of preconceptions and notions which contradict the Scriptures. Here we are in Revelation chapter 20, and now we'll see uh, verse 7, if you will. The Bible says, When the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, so this is after the thousand-year reign of Christ. Do you see that? Is that pretty clear in the Scripture? Following the thousand-year reign of Christ, he shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the seashore. And they went up on the breadth of the earth, and encompassed the camp of the saints about in the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven, and devoured them. Now let me stop here and just summarize who are the saints after the tribulation. I mean after, not the tribulation. Who are the saints after the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ? Anybody know who they are? Come on in. See guys. How many, who, who are the saints? We don't know. What? Well where's the church? Church has been taken. You don't see the church mentioned again. See, the church in Israel are not the same. If you read Romans chapter uh, 9 and 10 in the Scripture, one of the things that you'll find in Romans 9 and 10 is that God has a future plan for national Israel. Not, not Israel, spiritual Israel, but actual national unbelieving Israel. And in chapter 11, we see the conclusion that all of Israel will be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Uh, brother, there's uh, right in the back door right here, there's a nursery. I wish someone would get up and help you with it. But uh, Charlie, why don't you, uh, if you'd like, to, if you'd like uh, to be able to take him in there, that would be fine. He's fine to stay in here as well, but just so you know. You might okay. be louder you. Okay, that will be fine. <coughs> Looks like he wants to go in there. So, Anyway, yeah, that's an option for you. All right. So after the... I'm trying to remember where I was at now. Um, Saints. After the... Okay. Israel. The, the saints are the 144,000, the 12 tribes of 12,000 that have been part of the millennial reign. And who has come with the Lord Jesus when He stepped foot on the earth again? Sure. Yeah, the church did. So it's all the saints. Now there are some that have died during the thousand years and they won't be resurrected until the final judgment. And that's the events right now. So there are some that are dead, but everyone who has believed in Christ Jesus from the foundation of the world has come back with the Lord Jesus to reign in this thousand year reign. Every time I read the revelation, uh, the, the future events of the Lord Jesus Christ, I am shocked at the audacity of rebellion. And I'm also helped and reminded by the same. You know, sometimes we think that the reason people don't believe in God is because they cannot visibly see Him with their eyes. Isn't that what we think sometimes? I don't know, perhaps once a week, maybe once a month, but many times in a year, I'm asked the question, Pastor, what about the people who've never seen God or have never heard 
the gospel. What about those people that don't know the gospel? Is God going to judge people who have never heard or could not know? That's a good question, actually, isn't it? I think every one of us, each of us, ought to answer the same question. The answer to the question is there's no such thing. There's no such thing. You show me a person in the world who doesn't know about God and they'll have found out about God. You understand what I'm saying by that? Uh, I've had people say, well, I don't know. I didn't know there was a God. I don't know there's a God. Well, wait a second. Why are you talking about it? Well, what about people in the dark jungles of Africa who have never heard? My friend, there's no such thing. Romans chapter 1 plainly explains that every person who's ever been born knows there's a God. Listen, if you're, if you're a father, if you're a mother, and you talk about God to your children, have you ever had them go, explain to me what that is again? You know what a kid asks? Where did I come from? Isn't it true? Children ask, where did I come from? Why? Because what they're asking is, who is God? That's what that question is. Who made me? Who created me? We have an innate, inherent knowledge in our heart that there's a God. And any person who comes to the place where they say, I do not believe in God, are talking about an entity that they claim not to believe in. And they've come to a place of unbelief, but they did not begin that way. No child ever has questioned or doubted that there's a God. Every child knows there's a God, and when you tell them who God is, they believe it. Circumstances that are rebellion or a response to a perceived notion of who God is and a response to saying, I don't like who God is, lead people to unbelief. But no person's born in unbelief. Nowhere in the world is a person born in unbelief. It, it, for your amusement sometime, if you like uh, funny stories that have uh, good, me, good uh, endings to them, uh, read sometime the book, Cowboy Boots in Darkest Africa by evangelist Bill Rice. Uh, Bill Rice, what is he, the second? Bill Rice, the third's father. It's a fun book to read, but he talks about when he was in Africa with some missionaries, and they actually got guides to take them into a way back into jungles to a group of pygmy, pygmies that were rumored to exist. I mean, literally, they really had never come into contact with mankind. And he tells the story about how that they spent days preaching the gospel there, and a little man by the name of Tarasi. Uh, after he shared the gospel, he basically spoke out, and I'm summarizing, but he said, you know, that's always the way I thought it would be. That's what I always thought. He said, one day, he said, I climbed a tree, and I cried out, and I said, God, whoever you are, please come and save poor Tarasi. And guess who God sent? A guy from Tennessee with cowboy boots to preach the gospel in the jungles of Africa. And my friend, God can do that. He has the whole uh, unbeliever thing, Handled. An individual who is in darkness is in darkness because of a choice. Sometimes nations choose to band together in their unbelief, but one individual wanting to know God, my friend, God will respond to. And every person, the Bible says, has a knowledge of God in their hearts, and they actually know the kind of things about God that set him apart from pseudo or fake gods. That is the Godhead, and the Bible says so that they're without excuse. And so as we saw here in the Revelation, here is God, Jesus Christ, who is God. And He's sitting on an actual throne, and the saints are around Him, and the Satan, and the armies of the earth who are unbelievers, band themselves together, and they are coming out to do battle with God and the saints. It is not a figurative God. It's not the saints are representing an invisible God. It is a visible God on a visible throne who has reigned for a thousand years in a real Israeli kingdom. And they're coming to fight Him. That is insanity to the nth degree, isn't it? Like It's beyond me. I mean, any person who has seen God knows that we ain't the same, right? Uh, you ever see somebody, they've got a little bit of a Napoleon complex? Mm -hmm. You know what Napoleon complex is? I, before I knew that it was called Napoleon complex, I dubbed it the short man syndrome uh, when I was a kid. There was, I remember I could give you instances of just little dudes that it bothered them that they were little. 
And man, I'll tell you, they wanted to fight everybody to prove that they were big. But the problem was they weren't. And it never works out very well. Actually, you can be a tough little dude, but if you're a tiny little dude and you want to be a big dude, fight big dudes, it's not going to end up very well normally unless you cheat. Okay. These are men coming out to do battle with the individual who speaks battlefield slaughter, speaks with the sword of his mouth destruction. Literally, here's, you know, we're coming to fight God, and God says, dead. And literally, the blood flows up to the horse's bridles. That's the reality of it. My friend, rebellion is insanity, and if you're engaged in it, give it up. It's foolishness. My question is, how could people see the visible God and come out to rebel against Him or to fight against Him? The answer is, that's just the way rebellion is. You know, rebellion is the same in all of us. I'm not sure what the rebel thinks, except that the rebel is simply saying, I will not. Whatever. The rebel is not trying to determine, is this the best? Or can I succeed? The rebel is more interested in saying, nobody and no one is going to tell me what to do. I won't bow to anyone. That's, what, that's the rebel logic. Rebel isn't trying to win a cause. He's trying not to bow to a cause. And that's rebellion. And so here we have individuals coming out to be destroyed, and what they're proving is that they can't be uh, made to do anything. And so in verse 9, the Bible says, They went up the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about in the beloved city. The Bible says, And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. <laughs> That's a pretty simple, uh, a pretty simple end to it, isn't it? They gathered up in one place and God said, Whoa. Fire came down from heaven and devoured them. In verse 10, The devil that, was, that deceived them was cast in a lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was now found no place for them. Now, does this seem like a fearful place of judgment? It certainly is. It says in verse 11, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and the hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works, and death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. Then after that we see that God builds, makes a new heaven and a new earth. Will you go back to Matthew chapter 25 with me, please, this morning? Verse 31, the Bible says, When the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him. Then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory, and before Him shall be gathered all nations. And He shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. Now, in a pastoral society where people are agricultural, they would understand this analogy of the sheep and of the goats. This picture here is that out in the pasture are all the sheep and all the goats, and evidently they're pinned in, and they are allowed to go whatever direction, whichever direction they choose. So they're intermingled, they're mixed in. You say, Pastor, could there be goats in the church? God knows the answer to that question. God knows the answer to that question. We've got a goat team and a sheep team, I'm for sure. Uh, you know, the reality of it is, is that they're intermingled, they're mixed together, but God knows who they are. A shepherd... Uh, the illustration of a shepherd is that they, they know the voice. That Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them and they follow me. If you've ever seen a shepherd, sheep are very interesting because they follow their shepherd. Shepherd will make a noise or whatever, make just a, a, a hum and a burr noise, and the sheep will just follow him. His sheep will. Matter of fact, sheep can mix together. You could have five shepherds come to a well with their independent sheep, and the sheep will all mix up, just inter intermingle one with another. And when the shepherds get ready to leave, if they each just make their distinct sound when they start to go, the sheep will just kind of start following. A shepherd will just walk off like he's going to leave his sheep behind, and they follow him. That's pretty neat. 
if you actually watch it and actually see how sheep function. Well, goats aren't quite the same, but they mix in with sheep and they uh, don't seem to have problems uh, in living together and grazing together, that sort of thing. But God knows what's what. And the Bible says that He's going to separate the sheep and the goats. And then we see a description of all the nations. In uh, verse uh, 33, He shall set the sheep on His right hand, but the goats on the left. Uh, in verse 32, I guess, is where we see the description of the nations. Before Him shall be gathered all nations, and He shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. So God's going to separate the nations, the believing from the unbelieving. And here's the description, verse 34, Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And he uses the description of, I was hungry, and you gave me food, naked, and you clothed me. Verse 37, Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee, and hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee. And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. And so then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, and everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Now let me ask you a question. Are these events parallel to Revelation chapter 20? All the nations, they're separated and they go into everlasting judgment? Yes. This is not the pit for a thousand years. This is not hell. This is everlasting punishment. This is death and hell being cast into the lake of fire. And so it's eternal judgment. And in verse 44, Then shall they also answer me, this is the brethren, saying, Lord, when saw we thee in hunger, or thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, and in prison? and did not minister unto thee. These individuals are pretending to be sheep. Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Now we've seen a description, and the description ultimately is that the ones who are righteous are righteous because of what they've done. Now this is not a salvific sense. This is not the gospel. Individuals have taken Matthew 25 and turned it into the quote social gospel. You guys know what the social gospel is? We haven't talked about it in years and it's kind of faded off the scenes. But it, it really ended the revivals in America where people were getting born again and lives were being changed. And instead of, of the gospel being that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and rose again, and that salvation is a free gift, that you can receive Christ as your Savior, individuals begin to emphasize what happens after a person is saved. That is, that we love the brethren, and that we love, uh, and that we love people. Now, it's interesting that the social gospel teaches loving people whether they're brethren or not. Now, we're not supposed to hate our enemies. We're supposed to love our enemies. But it's interesting that the Bible says we're supposed to do unto the brethren. There are many individuals on a weekly basis who call me and they have an understanding of the social gospel. They'll say something like this. Past, uh, can I speak to the pastor? And I'll say, well, I'm pastor. Yeah, what can I do for you? And they'll say, well, listen, I need... And they'll start telling me what they need. And I'll ask the question. I'll say, uh, where are you from? Usually... Uh, very, they've either lived here a long time in our area or they're new to the area and they've been here maybe six months or so but generally speaking they need something they need their rent paid they need uh, the electric paid or they want me to give them cash which would be the preferred, preferred thing and there, there's no, there, we're not debating the, the need that they have a need or not and they'll say something like this I'll ask the question do I know you? have I met you before? Uh, no, uh, uh, you know, I said, well, where do you go to church? Well, either they'll say they go to a church, and I'll say, that, well, can I, let me, let me uh, have your number, and I'm going to call your pastor, and then I'll call you back. So I'm going to call their church and say, hey, there's people in your church that have a need. Why aren't you helping them? You know, I mean, isn't that what a church is supposed to do? If you do it unto the least of these, my brethren, so if your brothers, you're part of a family, you ought to help your family. 
If you're part of this church and you have a need, we ought to help you. And if you're part of this church and someone in this church has a need, they ought to help you. But here's what people tell me. They say, and I'll ask the question, well, why don't you come to our church? Or if you come to church Sunday, I'll often tell them, come to church Sunday and I'll see what I can do for you. Do you know in 12 years how few people have showed up on Sunday? And here's what they'll tell me. I'll get a lecture, a very, very pious lecture. Well, you guys don't help anybody. You don't do anything for anybody. You're supposed to be. That's what a church is supposed to be. You got all this money and you da 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 And they preach the social gospel to me. That is that being a Christian is giving stuff to people that don't care about worshiping God or loving God. And uh, the, the, it was propagated by a pastor by the name of uh, Charles Sheldon. Do you know who I'm talking about? A pastor in Topeka. He wrote, In His Steps. That's where we get the What Would Jesus Do From? And it started the social gospel, which de-emphasized the gospel and emphasized works for salvation. And if you'll ever uh, read the story of the first part of, of his book, a man go, who is uh, homeless goes around trying to get help from different people, and then he walks into the church and gives them this speech about, you all say that you you know love God and you're Christians and all this, but I've been trying to get you to help me all week, and he falls down and dies. And uh, then everybody feels badly, and they, then they start trying to act like Jesus would do, and they lose everything they have, and, and uh, everything turns out hunky-dory in the end. More people die. And uh, anyway, in his steps... That's the name of the book, and there's a movie. If you if you like cheesy movies, I recommend it. It's very, very cheesy, and that's my favorite kind of movie, and so I recommend it to you for a nice family pastime, but it's teaching the social gospel. The social gospel is oftentimes taught from Matthew 25, in as much as you did to the least of one of these. But Jesus said, one of these, my brethren. Those individuals on the left said, Lord, you were hungry, and we fed you. You were thirsty, and we gave you drink. You were unclothed, and we gave you. And Jesus said, depart from me, I never knew you. It's interesting, the ones on the right hand said, when did we do that? And Jesus said, when you did this, you did it. And the ones on the left said, we always did that. And Jesus said, I don't know who you are. And my friend, that's the opposite of the social gospel, actually, isn't it? See, it have to be part of the brethren. Let's just dial back just a minute. We'll draw some conclusions from some of the things we've looked at here this morning. First of all, this. It's taboo to say today, but judgment is impending. Doom is coming. The very same individuals who would rail against God and accuse Him of not being loving and not being good because there's a hell are the same individuals who'd say that God is not good and God is not loving because He lets people get away with things. You ever heard somebody say that? If God's good, then how come there's so much evil in the world? And the same people say, well, if God's good, why doesn't He just forgive? You know what I'm talking about? Same people say the same thing. And they're opposites, aren't they? The reality of it is, is that God is good and He allows evil for a while because He's merciful. See, most of us never realize or we never come to grips with the reality that if God judged the wicked, there wouldn't be survivors. If God came in this room today and dealt with sin, you'd be dead. And so would I. But instead, God judged His Son, Jesus, in our place. And He gave us the opportunity to have the righteousness of Jesus Christ simply for the asking of it. Whosoever shall call the name of the Lord shall be saved. My friend, God judges sin. He judges His own Son. He's so serious about judging sin. And God is merciful. He's not just destroying the wicked. He's giving them a space and a place for repentance. And none of the individuals whom we have seen described in either text today have come to a place of judgment because they were good and didn't know any better. They come to a place of judgment because they put themselves there by first rejecting Jesus as their Savior and secondly rebelling against God. It's amazing the level of piety that individuals who blaspheme the name of God and who mock righteousness and morality and holiness, it's amazing how that's the piety of today. Individuals think that people who speak against sin are just wicked and despicable and judgmental and horrible. We have all kinds of words that are new labels for sin. 
See, if I were to preach the what the God calls sin, if I were to call sin what it is, if I were to call sexual sin what it is, if I were to call uh, uh, just moral sin, and the lack of love for God what it is, I'd be called a bigot. That's a new word for sinner. There's a new righteousness today, and the righteousness today and the new morality of today says that everything is acceptable except saying something's wrong. Listen, don't judge. I'll judge you for judging. Don't judge. The only thing that is wrong in the world, the only thing that is un, in, or with, or intolerable in the entire world is saying something is wrong. We're so into tolerance today, aren't we? Well, don't, you know what? Don't judge that. You know, you don't know where somebody's... You know, we need to be tolerant of that. We need to be tolerant of this. We need to be tolerant of that. But if you say, you know what? That's wrong. And nobody should tolerate that. Oh, you're intolerant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we won't tolerate that. Isn't it so? It's the new morality. Intolerance of intolerance. That is righteousness. If a person tries to abide... By God's word and God's law and God's way, we don't have any tolerance for that. That's wicked. And these are the individuals that would say, "Hey, you know, look. I mean, I tolerated everybody. Look, gee, look what a good person. I accepted everything. I was okay with anything. I didn't judge anybody except for God. I didn't do. Look. And Jesus said, "Depart from me." And my friend, you and I must remember that we need to put on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And it's amazing that the individuals who are on the right hand are very unaware of anything they've done by way of service to the Lord. Isn't that surprising? You know, there is a such thing as reward, eternal reward. The Bible very, very plainly teaches it. Do you know how much eternal reward you have? Do you have a little book where you keep record of the things you've done? For the Bible says that if we do things to be seen of men, we have our reward. But if we do it unto the Lord, then we have eternal treasures, eternal riches in heaven. Do you know what kind of rewards you have? Frankly, I have no idea about myself. You know, sometimes I think, man, I'm such a failure. I could have done so much more in my life for Jesus Christ. And I don't know what God knows about me as far as His record book. But I know this, my friend. I know what group I'm in. I know whether I'm a sheep or a goat, and I know why. It's because of Jesus, and it's part of being. It's because of being part of the beloved, or of the brethren. So you can't do anything for the Lord Jesus until you're one of His children, until you're one of the brethren. There are individuals who are trying to work their way to heaven by good works. Listen, it's easy to draw a crowd for a soup kitchen. If we say we're going to feed the homeless, listen, we'll get a better turnout than when we can get on a Sunday. And I think that's a nice thing. I'm not, I'm not saying that's altogether bad. But listen, I have people all the time that call and say, I want to give to the homeless. I want to give to the poor. I want to whatever. And I try to talk to them about Jesus, and they don't want anything to do with Jesus. And you know, that's a pretty clear line between the sheep and the goats. So the goats are all about feeding, giving drink, clothing, but they're not at all about Jesus. My friend Jesus knows who are His own. Does He not? Our Savior knows His own. The question for you here today, practically speaking, is this. Where do you belong? What crowd are you a part of? See, there isn't an uncertainty here. There isn't a, well, I, you know what, it's just going to have to come down to that gathering when the, you know, Jesus brings them all together and separates the sheep from the goats, and I'll find out. No, my friend, it's pretty clear how to be part of the sheep and not of the goats. The Bible is really, really clear about that. The, the Bible puts it this way in John chapter 3 about the gospel. For God so loved his, the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting, but have eternal life. Uh, for God sent not... Boy, I messed that all up, didn't I? Uh, he that believeth, verse 18 is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed. But from what's the gospel? Jesus, the cross. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's a fact. You might think you're the worst person in the world when you look inside yourself and get to know yourself, but the reality of it is is that we're all the same way. 
We've all come short of the glory of God. And we deserve, we deserve death. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. How do we receive eternal life? How do we get it through Jesus? Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And my friend, you may be here today and you may have thought, well, you know something, I'm a good person. Well, that's a lie. That's a lie, isn't it? Listen, I'm not trying to insult you. I just know myself well enough. And uh, I just don't think you're you know, a whole lot better than me. And if, even if you were, uh, the fact is, is that you're still a sinner. And you're not compared to me. You're not compared to others. You're compared to Jesus. And He's God's gold standard of holy. High and lifted up, perfect. You don't compare. And so isn't it a wonderful thing that Jesus became sin, died on the cross, having never sinned, and took the place? How does a person receive that free gift? Well, how you get any free gift? By accepting it. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Listen, when I was a child, I came to understand how serious my sin was and how greatly I deserved eternal judgment. And when I understood that there was a free gift offered, that I could have eternal life, I asked for it. I don't remember the words that I prayed, but I confessed my sin to God. And you know what? I didn't, it didn't need the confession. I just acknowledged, God, I know I'm a sinner. And I know, I know that Jesus died for my sin. I want to be saved. I, want, I, want, I said, I want Jesus to come into my heart. And I know a lot of people have a problem with people saying that, but the reality of it is that the Holy Spirit of God is Christ in us. And my friend Jesus came in. He came into my life. And He's never left and He never will. He said, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. And if a child can do that, an adult could become like a child and do the same, couldn't they? Or just ask God, I don't understand everything, I don't know everything, but I know the important things. I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. And I want Jesus to be my Savior. Will you save me? Receive Christ as your Savior. It's that simple. And then what do we live for? What do we live for? If you know Jesus as your Savior, well then we live for the brethren, live for Jesus Christ, don't we? We do it unto the least of these. It would be a tragedy, wouldn't it, if one of the brethren uh, were hungry and didn't receive food or were thirsty and didn't receive drink or needed clothing and it wasn't done for them? Because it would be like not doing it for Jesus. If Jesus has covered them covered their sin and you reject them, you've rejected a person who is covered by Jesus as the righteousness of Christ. And oh, friend, that would be foolish. And so there's application for the lost today and there's application for those that are saved, isn't there? Where do you fall? Where do you stand? You know Jesus as your Savior. God, I pray that you would help us to simply apply the Scripture today and to be able to understand the importance of knowing Christ as our Savior. Lord, I pray that there would be an individual in this room today that does not have confidence that they have eternal life or has never heard the Gospel. I pray that today would be their day of salvation. Lord, if there are saved people in this room who are confused about the social Gospel or future judgment, and they're not living in light of the imminent return of Jesus, God, I just ask that You would show us how what a folly that is. Before I finish my prayer, I'd like to ask each person in this room to keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. And do not look around for just a few seconds for the sake of the privacy of every other person here today. Here this morning, and you would simply say, well, you know, Pastor, uh, when I see this eternal judgment, one thing judgment reminds me about is that I don't want to be judged by God. I'm afraid of a righteous God. I'm afraid to be judged by God. And actually, I know, I kind of know uh, that if God were to judge me, I'm a goat, not a sheep. I, I don't understand how to have eternal life. I, I have not received Jesus as my Savior. That's all I know about that. Would you pray for me, Pastor, because I do not want to stand in God's judgment. Will you just slip your hand up real quickly? No one looking around. wouldn't call out or embarrass you. But just slip your hand up. Pray, pray for me, Pastor. I'm afraid that I would be judged if God were to separate the sheep and the goats. I would be part of the individuals who maybe have done good works, but do not have the Savior. Okay? Slip your hand right back down. I see that. Before we continue on, I want to 
just simply explain how a person could make a decision to receive Christ as your Savior. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And if you would just recognize today that righteous works are wickedness before God, but that Jesus' Son lived on this earth without ever having sinned and yet died for sin, died for your sin, so that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You could today just say, You know what, God, I'm a sinner, but I know Jesus died for my sin. And I want to be saved because of what Jesus did. If you just tell God that, understanding that simple truth, God will save you. God, I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to be judged for my sin, but I want I know Jesus died for my sin and I want you to save me. If you mean that from your heart, God will save you right now. For everyone else here today, if God has spoken to your heart and He's shown you shown you with clarity. Hey, there are things that are doctrinal, that are teaching about the future judgment after the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Or if God has shown you today how important it is that we live in light of the fact that the next event in God's calendar is that, the, that Jesus is going to call us up. We're only going to have a limited time to feed the poor and to clothe the poor and to give drink to the poor as unto the Lord Jesus. You say, you know, God's convicted me about that. I want to live for Jesus more. You do business with Him right now before we end our invitation time this morning. God, I thank You so much this morning for Jesus, for the cross, and for the work that You've done on our behalf. Lord, I just pray uh, for any person in this room this morning that asked Jesus to save them. God, I just ask that you would give them confidence that they have eternal life. And then, God, I pray uh, for we who are your children. Lord, I pray that you would help us to see the importance of living for Jesus in this life. We thank you for what you've taught us now today. We ask it in, his, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, this morning, because we don't have a piano player, that was our invitation. It's a little bit different. But if you need someone to pray with you or you need to talk to somebody or you have some questions to ask, I'm available uh, pretty much all the time. I'm available after the service today until 105, which is just short of an hour, 10 minutes short of an hour, 15 minute, 50 minutes, so I can talk to you after the service. Uh, I'm also available all the time during the week. You can call my phone, and if I don't answer it, I will try to call you right back. It's usually if you try and call and I don't answer the phone, it's normally because I'm talking on, on with someone else at the same time and I'll get back with you. But leave me a message or call me right back and I'll get with you. I'm available for you. It's my privilege to be able to help you with spiritual matters or anything at all that I could uh, do for you to serve you. Let me say, as I sometimes do, that first of all, it's a delight to be here with you today. I'm glad that you came. I miss the folks that aren't here today, but I'm glad that you're here. And so thanks for worshiping with us. I hope you'll come back. We have a service tonight at 6 p.m. Also, 7 p.m. on Wednesday, or you can go to Miami Beach with us this afternoon if you like as well. Also, uh, we don't close the invitation in our church. We close the service, but if God's spoken to you about something and you didn't have closure or clarity about something, uh, God's always inviting you to come. It's never too late while you're living and you're breathing. I love what Solomon said in Ecclesiastes. He said, a, a live dog is better than a dead lion. You know, I've been a dog a lot of times. Uh, but I'd rather be a live dog than a dead lion, wouldn't you? And so that's God's attitude. You're living and you're breathing. God isn't done with you yet. He can use you and He can do amazing things. You may be in a mess at this juncture in your life, and yet God, if you turn yourself to Lord Jesus Christ, God can take a mess and He can just do things that are impossible for man. And He loves you. And I hope you know it. And I love you and consider it a privilege to be your pastor. You have a great day. You're dismissed. Thank you.